my joy to be here tonight to join in the open air. And I want to thank Pastor Bertie very much for giving me that opportunity to come. And I trust as the meeting progresses tonight that we're going to share and enjoy the Word of the Lord together. This book that I hold in my hand tonight, friends, is commonly called the Bible or God's Precious Word. Many names are given to describe it. I love this old book because, as we heard in song tonight, it contains many things that brings to you and I eternal and everlasting benefits. If there is one thing above another that I would dare to exalt in the Bible, it is what I would describe the way that it talks about God's salvation and the simplicity <clears throat> with which the Bible identifies or shows to us the way that we can find salvation, peace with God, and the assurance of heaven when life is past and gone. Out in eternity, we're aware of the fact, I'm sure all are who listen tonight, that there is a heaven to gain. There is also a hell to shun. As you stand around and sit in your car or wherever you are, tonight finds you traveling to one of those two destinies. The Bible talks about a narrow way that leads to heaven and home. And it talks about a broad way which leads to eternal destruction and to eternal damnation. The question I ask you now is this, on which of those roads are you traveling? Let me come back to the simplicity of the way of salvation, friend, that is described for us within this great Bible. For example, there is John 3 and 16. And I'm sure that all who listen to my voice at this moment are familiar with that great verse. My, how God has used it down through the years to the salvation of hundreds and thousands and possibly millions of people. I knew a fella very, very well. And he was sitting in a pub one night and he was drinking and he was terribly distressed and troubled about spiritual matters. There was an open-air meeting going on outside on the street of the town. And as the companion of his was walking past, the preacher happened to quote John 3 and 16. He came into the pub where this man was. And he said to the man, Hugh, do you know what this preacher has just said? And to Hugh, he quoted John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As Hugh sat there in what we might call a state of spiritual depression, worried and concerned about where he would spend eternity, he didn't go out of the pub, but he dropped on his knees in the front of the bar and he cried out for God to save him. I have had the privilege of taking part in meetings with that fella. And what a thrill it was to my heart to know that he had got wonderfully saved because he was actually a school pal of mine. He and I went along to the school together. Yes, friend, think of it. Who 
whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are many who would try to tell you tonight that you can obtain salvation by works. I wonder, am I talking to someone thinking like that as you sit around at the open air? I would ask you a question tonight, friend. The question I would ask you is this. For how many works do you need in order to obtain heaven? You might say to me, I suppose, and rightly so, preacher, I have no idea. Well, my friend, what are you going to do if you end in heaven, in eternity rather, depending on works and discover that you're far too short? You would be in a dreadful predicament. Then there may be someone here and you're depending on some form of religion. Well, I would ask you the question, my friend, which religion is the correct one? What a tragedy it would be if you had followed faithfully religious practice for a lifetime and when you end in eternity, discover that you were wrong all the way through. You see, friend, this old book that I hold in my hand tonight, a book that God has used to fill heaven with people who knew Christ as their Savior and their Lord, knows of none of these things. The way of salvation is simply to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We will not complicate that. We dare not complicate it. The simplicity of it is clear and plain. An old man I knew many years ago who preached the gospel well and preached it faithfully and so many saved. He used to say that the plan of salvation was simply sublime. I believe the man was absolutely correct. Let me quote you another verse. When you come into the Acts of the Apostles, and if you care to read it, whenever you get the opportunity tonight, take down your Bible and read chapter 16. You'll find two men there, Saul of Tarsus, who became the great Apostle Paul, and Silas, his companion. And for doing good, they ended up in prison. They ended up with their feet in the stocks in the very death cell. And I'm sure the circumstances were terribly, terribly uncomfortable. But you know, friends, instead of lamenting and complaining about the seriousness of their condition that night, they prayed and they sang. Now, I don't know what the sang. I have no idea at all. I don't think they had a hymn book or anything of the kind. Possibly they were singing of their experiences. Possibly they were singing some of the psalms. I don't know. Did they sing Psalm 22, which describes wonderfully and clearly the work of the cross, beginning with those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did they sing Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And it ends with those amazing words. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. However, while they were talking to God and singing His praises, they also had something else in mind. The Bible says the prisoners heard them. Now, read the story and you'll see what happened. An earthquake came. The prison was shaken from stem to stern. God just took it in His hand and he shook it, and shook it terribly. Every gate was opened. Every man's bands were loosed. 
and not a prisoner moved. Everyone was held there, I believe, by the almighty power of God. Now listen. The old jailer woke from his sleep, was terrified. And my friends, as he saw what had happened and saw the doors open and knew the chains had fallen off, he drew the sword and he was about to take his own life when Paul, the apostle, stopped him. And when he stopped him, friend, and told him that all was well and the prisoners were there and no one was gone, he recognized, yes, this is God. He came right into that death cell. He brought these two men out and he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Oh, I wonder. At the open air meeting tonight, friend, as you sit and listen or as you walk by, have you ever asked that question? What must I do to be saved? You know, as I look at that statement and have thought about it many a time, there's a word in there troubles me a little, and it's the word do. What must I do to be saved? Was there just the possibility that the jailer thought he had something to do? My friend, if that's your idea tonight, you are so wrong. You cannot add to a finished work. I remember having a gospel mission away down the south of Ireland one time, many years ago. And I said to the lady of the house before I went to bed that the night prior to this incident, would you mind if I get up early in the morning and make a telephone call? It was a call that I urgently need to make. She said, no problem. You go ahead and use the phone. So I got up out of bed and that morning made this telephone call and as I was making the telephone call, there was a kind of a little porch at the front of the house. And there were red tiles on it. And I noticed the lady's mother-in-law. Now, you know what I'm saying, ladies. The ladies and the mother-in-law, sometimes they go all right and sometimes they go all wrong. I think you know what I mean. I heard a preacher say one time at a wedding, that Adam was a happy, blessed man because he married the only woman in the world, and that was Eve, and he had no mother-in-law, none at all to bother him. But I noticed this lady with a tin of polish, and I never forgot the name of it. It was called Cardinal, and she was busy cleaning the tiles in the front porch. Well, she finished off the work. I couldn't get through to this number, and I went upstairs, and I came back down, and what do you think? But the daughter-in-law was busy polishing the tiles in the front porch with a tin of cardinal polish when the mother-in-law appeared. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. You can imagine it yourself. World War III nearly broke out in that particular house that particular morning. Why? Because the mother-in-law had done the job. She felt it was good enough. And now the daughter-in-law comes in, and she's adding to it. What an insult to God, friend, to try to add to the finished work of Calvary. I tell you, when Jesus, we heard about him from Brother Bertie tonight, went to that old cross, was kneeled by the hands and by the feet to the tree, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a Savior! And he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. How dare I, how dare anyone, seek to add to that work and take praise to themselves? What a terrible thing to do. What kind of a place would heaven be if it was filled with boasters? Sure, you wouldn't want to stay 10 minutes. I cannot be bothered listening to people blowing their trumpet. It's something annoys me. You know, I, when I hear people blowing their trumpet, I often think they have to do it because nobody else will. You see, ah, it's not a good idea. And my friend, 
don't add to the finished work. What must I do, do, do to be saved? Lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him and him alone, gloriously complete. It is finished, said the Savior. Finished every jot. Sinner, this is all you need. Tell me, is it not? I want to tell you it is. The finished work is enough. There's millions in heaven tonight because of the finished work of Calvary who simply rested and trusted in the Savior. And you can join them by doing exactly as they did, repenting of your sin and coming as a sinner to Jesus. But listen, here's this verse I'm coming to. What must I do to be saved? Oh, listen to the answer, my friend. Came from the lips of Paul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now listen to that. Let me repeat it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Are you listening, friend, to the simplicity of this again? Believe. Be saved. Oh, let's try our best to get it over. Believe. Be saved. Believe, be saved. That's God's way of salvation. Not mine, not any other man. It's God's great redemption plan. Faith in Christ is all that's needed. And listen, Paul went on to say this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Maybe I'm talking to a father and mother, or father or mother, or both tonight at the open air meeting. You brought a family of boys and girls into the world. Well, that's the normal and natural way that life goes. But I wonder, friend, have you shown them Christ? I wonder, have you set the example of turning from your sin to the Savior? I remember sitting in the home with a man one day, and he looked at me and he said, Harvey, what am I going to do with a drunken son? The son had virtually become an alcoholic. But the son again had been a pal of mine in the early days. And I looked at the father and I said, John, listen, I'm going to turn the question in on you. What's the son going to do with a drunken father? I said, I can remember many a time that the son sat on your knee and you allowed him to take the cork out of the bottles as you drank them. And when it got to the end of the bottle, you allowed him to finish it. I said, I saw that over and over again. Why put the blame on someone else? Let's take the responsibility to where it lies tonight. Will you, have you trusted the Savior? Tell me, mother, have you brought children into the world to show them the way to heaven or the way to hell? That's a question that only you can answer. Your responsibility as a parent is to have done with sin. Your responsibility as a parent is to repent, turn from sin, have done with it totally. Take a look at where it's taking you and maybe the family along with you, down to a lost sinner's hell. Get to the cross. Get to the Savior. Get the forgiveness of sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and give God a toehold in the family. And you could come as a sinner to Jesus tonight. And what a difference it would make. I was down preaching way down in the far side of Hollywood one night. Now, I'm not talking about Hollywood where all the movie stars are. I'm talking at the one down near Bangor. That's roughly the part of the world I come from originally. And I was there for a number of Sunday evenings in this particular fellowship. 
And after the meeting was over one night, a lady waited behind. And I discovered that this lady was a backslider. Maybe I'm talking to a backslider tonight. It's nothing to be proud of, friend. Nothing to be proud of to allow Christ to save you and then turn your back on him and go and live for the devil. Nothing to be proud of at all. But I knew nothing about this lady, but in the meeting that night, God gripped her. And she was in a state. And she came back after the meeting and wept her way into the embrace of the Savior. What an experience it was. She left and went home. And I wondered how this would go. But the following Sunday evening, when I was back again, she was there. But this time, she had a husband and a little girl with her. Now, I don't know what age the little girl was, maybe six or seven years of age. This is 40 years ago I'm going back. And you know, friends, after the meeting was over, the husband stayed behind. And he said to me, brother, listen. He said, I just want to talk to you for a minute. He said, I'm so, so thankful for what happened to my wife last Sunday night. So thankful. He told me the story. He said, you know, when we married, the two of us, she was an excellent Christian. Lived for the Lord. And then one day something happened. He says, I can't explain what happened. She turned her back on everything went out into the world. And these are his words and not mine. He said, she literally became a woman of the street. Now, you can take out of that whatever you like. That's all I'm saying about it. He said, you know, I didn't know what to do. But he said, for the sake of our little girl, I stuck to her and I prayed. He said, last night, last Sunday night, when she came home from that meeting, I knew God had answered prayer. I knew she was back to the Savior. But he said, here's why I've come to tell you this. He says, the other evening, I was putting our little girl to bed. And the Bible says a little child shall lead them. And this man told me this with tears tripping him. I'll never forget it. He said, as the wee girl was saying her prayers, she looked up to heaven. She said, Lord Jesus, thank you for sending me a new mommy. Thank you for sending me a new mommy. Isn't that amazing? All is changed when Jesus came or comes to stay. Men and women tonight, the boys and girls need to see Christ in your life. They need to see Jesus in you. And you're responsible to put him there. You're responsible to give him a toehold in your family. And if you do that, that family of yours could be saved and mightily owned and mightily blessed of God. Let me bring you to one final verse. If you want to know where this verse is, friends, it's over in the Acts of the Apostles again, only this time it's chapter 4. And it's an amazing story. You know, as you go through the Acts of the Apostles and you read, and the Gospels, you'll discover that <clears throat> there were a bunch of ill-meaning individuals tearing about and following the Lord Jesus and the Apostles and trying to do all the harm they could. And here's two men, and Peter and John this time. And they end up in trouble because a miracle, an obvious miracle, was performed on the body of a needy man. However, I'm taking you no further than that tonight. But Peter, now I like Peter because Peter was a big man, and so am I. And Peter was a fisherman, and I'm a fisherman's son. And uh, Peter did nothing but stupid things sometimes. And, well, I suppose if you know me, you'll say yes, and you're just the same. And there's probably a certain amount of truth in that. But I like Peter. He was a remarkable character. But you know, friends, he got an opportunity to speak to those who were against him. And here's what he said. 
I want to leave this verse with you tonight because the time's almost away. He's talking to religious people, people who should have known better, and sadly and unfortunately didn't. And here's what he said. Neither is there salvation in any other. That's the 12th verse of the chapter 4 of the Acts. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Christ and Christ alone. Men and women, listen. Christ plus anything, Christ minus anything, is a perverted gospel. The gospel is Christ, and Christ is the gospel. That's it. And you can meet him tonight at this open air meeting. The master is come. And he calleth for thee. We've heard it already. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Not salvation's person. It's Christ. Salvation's place. There's none other name given under heaven among men. That's the only place you can get saved. No salvation in hell. Those who sadly and tragically end up there can't have it. And those who gloriously end up in heaven don't need it because they have it already. Neither of these places are where you get saved. You get saved under heaven among men. This is the place. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. What an opportunity. What a chance for you to get the Savior tonight. You're in the right place. And the Lord is here. He's talking to you. And salvation's priority is here. There's none other name given under heaven amongst men whereby, are you listening? We must be saved. If you forget everything I have said tonight, friend, as you walk past, as you sit around, as you sit in your car, wherever you are, try and think on those words. Let the truth of them come right home to your heart just now. We must be saved saved. It's a must. You're not going to heaven without it. We must be saved. Man, as you listen tonight, you must be saved. Woman, as you listen tonight, you too must be saved. Teenagers, as you pass us by tonight, you must be saved, boys and girls, wherever you are, you too must be saved. Can we help you tonight? If you're concerned and troubled and feel you'd like a little help, come on over, have a chat to us. We'll be around here for a little time, tidying up and what have you. Be a thrill tonight to sit with someone and lead them to this great Savior. May the Lord bless you.